hearing God. Hearing God. What does it mean to hear? What does it mean to hear from God? It is a week away. Somebody tell me what it is. All right, our gospel meeting starts, Lord willing, a week from today. We've been thinking about it and planning it and hopefully putting it on our calendar and all that. And we're almost there. It's almost time. We're a week out from our fall special series or our fall gospel meeting. A time when we'll have Jeff Jenkins. and He'll deliver over a period of four days six different lessons or sermons about being a Christian, about the Christian lie. hope you're making plans to be there. But how can we prepare beyond just that? How can we participate? And if we had to, to summarize this morning, the overall might be with those two words. And if you're following the handout this morning, you've got the one word, hopefully, and the other word is, the, the two words, let's just say, are sharing and hearing. Sharing and hearing. Sharing in that we, it's an opportunity for us to Think about sharing that time together. But, but also, it's an opportunity to share with others, to invite others, to remind others, hey, we've got a special event coming up. Why don't you join us for that? And then the hearing part is to come and, and not just be here, but hear. And a lot of this is true of always, it's not just about a, a, a certain event, but it's a great time to step back and emphasize the importance of listening to God in His Word. A great time to come in a week, today and in a week to reset and recharge those spiritual batteries, to realign our hearts with God's heart. And so this morning... I have for us some reminders as, as we look toward that event. But again, it's not just about that. It's, it's, a, it's a good opportunity, an appropriate time to be reminded of some truths about the power of God's Word, but also to be reminded of our response to His Word. On that note then, these three ideas for this morning. A powerful word or a powerful message. The reality that hearing matters. Hearing matters. And then, hopefully, if Jesus is willing, we will look at our opportunity. Our opportunity. So there's where we're going. Let's take the first step. A powerful word. Success. We define it in different ways. We, we, we really we want to be successful in whatever we do in life. Maybe there's certain things we really want to do well. We want things to go as they're supposed to. And then we, we can step back and, ah, success. But there are no guarantees. Anything that we do as humans, there's always at least the possibility that things will go wrong and that our best laid plans and whatever it is that we might put out there or whatever task we're involved in may not work. But that is not true with God. And it is not true with what comes from God in His Word. I encourage you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 55, 55th chapter of Isaiah. God through Isaiah is reminding us as we read this chapter that His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And that comes into play with these two verses because it is not that everybody is going to be positively receptive to God's work. Not that even everybody is going to pay any attention. But it is that within His purposes, when He puts His Word, when He sends His Word out, it will bring success. 
it will accomplish his intentions. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, he says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but, with, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish success, that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The reason that the Word of God, whether originally spoken and then written down, and Isaiah did both of those, God tells Isaiah, I'm putting my Word in your mouth now. I'm putting it in, my, in the words that you are inscribed. The reason that this is a powerful word, even that we hold this morning, as we have it in this written, settled medium, the reason it is a powerful word is because it is the Word of God. And because God is infinitely powerful, creator and sustainer of everything that we know. When He gives a word, contains that kind of creative, changing, impacting power. It's a powerful word. You can actually mark out A, and you might just say it is the powerful word. Or the powerful word. God works in this work. And here's a couple of ways that he works in us. One of those is faith. It's a, it's a passage that gets quoted fairly often. It's when the Apostle Paul in Romans 10 emphasizes the need for those to be sent, for preachers to, to go, and for those to hear and believe the work. And there's, he builds this pattern here of how all this works and the different components the message the messenger the hearer and then he makes this observation in romans 10 17 for faith comes by what hearing and hearing by the word of god romans 10 17 there might be some things that are equally beneficial but there is nothing that is more beneficial to my, to our, to my spiritual growth, to grow faith in our hearts, than this powerful word. We're sometimes told that there are all these different ways to hear from God. And sometimes it seems that hearing from God comes down to my subjective feelings on a subject. But it is in this book, it is when I study it, when I read it, it is when the, the Bible class teacher or the preacher of the hour stands to proclaim and present a message from the Scriptures that we hear from God. And hearing the message from a God like ours, it has the power embedded within it to give faith. Initially, and that's this context here, those who haven't heard it all and then they hear the good news about Jesus, they hear the teachings from God and it creates faith. But it also then gives greater faith. And if you're a Christian today, that should be a given, shouldn't it? That you want more faith. I, you shouldn't have to survey or raise your hand if you want to increase your faith. Now, we may not always act like we do, but who wouldn't want more faith? Who wouldn't want to be more committed, more loyal, more active? And it's one thing for the preacher or an elder or somebody to stand up and say, 
You need to be more committed to Jesus. You need to be more active in the church. There might be a place for that. But it's something here about, here's a concrete step I can take to have more faith in Jesus and be more active for Jesus. Is the time that I spend, whether that's read, study, listen, meditate, memorize. And I know sometimes we emphasize the, the sermon or the Bible class, but far from that. Yet, those are meant to be major parts of the life of a Christian. It's getting together with other Christians to hear from God in His Word. It will grow your faith. But then it also will build you up. Let's read that one together. Let's turn from, we might still be in Isaiah. Look with me at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. The scene is Paul giving his farewell to the elders from the church in Ephesus. They travel a good distance to meet him at the coast. And he lets them know, this is, I'm not going to see you again. These are, this is the leadership of the church that Paul spent his longest time at. That there's something special about Ephesus. We sometimes talk about the, those in, in, the Philippians being special to Paul, the, Thessalon, the Thessalonians, but the Ephesians, that's where he spent his, his time. And so as he pours his heart out and they pour out theirs and as they shed tears and they hug and embrace, he tells them this. Here's what he leaves them with. Acts 20, verse 32. He says, And now I commend you to God. And that, that's where it starts. And we don't want to skip over that. And sometimes it might be, at least this is the accusation, that sometimes Christians are they're just about the Bible. And it's just, it's just the text. He says, I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace which is able, Here, here's this powerful word, able to build you up. We were singing about that a minute ago. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken. Not that that's specifically what Paul has in mind here, but who, who doesn't need strength? Encouragement, building up, faith, connect it, right? To grow your faith, to build you up. It says it will build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Here's how this powerful word works. I'm hearing from God in His Word. It will strengthen me to build my faith as I have the authoritative, here's what God says. And if, if I follow through with that, if I allow that to work in my life that way, it will be a part of what leads me to the inheritance of life with Jesus and all His saints, all His holy people forever. That's why we say this word is a powerful word. But none of that will happen in my life if I don't pay attention. And, and, and like we said with Isaiah 55, the failure is not with me, or not with God, rather. It is with me. Because the powerful Word can, can be there all day long, and it is, in that sense, it's there all day long. And we have the abundant blessing of amazing access to the Word of God in our own native tongue. That's why it's a powerful Word, but hearing makes the difference. Consider that. Hearing matters. 
And so I don't mean this morning something about hearing, matters of hearing, but more that hearing does matter. You have to have both. God's given us His powerful Word. And now, He asks of us, Are you listening? How do you hear? If you're here on a Sunday morning, you might be thinking about the ball game yesterday or the one that's happening right now or about to happen here in a few minutes or whatever. But probably somewhere in there, you're your ears take in some of what's being said and what's being read. How do I hear? Because it's one thing for that auditory process to happen. It's one thing, and we hear in so many different ways, and we've got ways to help hearing loss from hearing aids to cochlear implants, and we've got PA systems to amplify and all that. But if my heart... If my intellect isn't engaged when I'm hearing from God, it doesn't matter. In Mark chapter 4, Mark records Jesus giving the parable of the soils, the seed, the sower, the explanation of the parable that he gives to the disciples, and thankfully Mark has it recorded for us through the Spirit. It's in Mark chapter 4, 13 through 20. The sower that went out, he sows sows the seed to four different types of soil or terrain. Jesus explains that those are four different types of heart and how they respond to the seed that is the Word of God, hearing from God. If you look at all four, Jesus says specifically, Mark 4, that each of them hear. He uses the word hear all four times. They all hear the Word of God. But what happens after that is the difference. So it's about how you hear. Is it just that that those words are coming in my ear and then as we say, in one ear and what? Out the other. That might be one way of paraphrasing that first part. It never really gets past the initial exposure to God's Word. And it's, and it's like each, each of these hearts, somewhere, the process breaks down. There's stages that occur. The heart that we want to cultivate is that final one, where they hear, they believe the Word, they receive it, they accept it, and then they bear fruit. The real test of whether I've truly heard God speak in His Word is whether it produces, whether it can be seen. That here's what I, what's been the result of my hearing God's Word. In, in a positive way, I mean, sometimes there's a result, but it's that somebody becomes bitter or hard-hearted. Here it's hearing. What does that mean? And before this and after this, in Mark 4, Jesus will say, he who has ears to hear. And it's not about your actual physiology. If you really want this word, let him hear. By the way, Jesus will use that exact same phrase to all of the churches he writes to later in Revelation 2 and 3. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. How do I hear? And when it comes to a sermon, we say, I, I, heard, I hear you. We go out, we shake the preacher's hand. Good sermon, preacher. But did we actually hear? I don't know that's easy for me to say. Cause I'm the guy that's standing up here most Sunday. And that's where the preacher, and sometimes this happens more in the preparation, where the preacher's preaching to the preacher. It makes me think of Ezekiel's day. In Ezekiel, 
Look, look at Ezekiel 33. Let's read this one, and then we'll, we'll have to move on. Ezekiel chapter 33. Is it on the screen? All right. 33, the last few verses here. It's one of those little counts that is kind of tucked away in the book that we don't spend a lot of time in. It sometimes seems, my experience, Ezekiel. But, but it's also... Let, let's read it. Isaiah, or Ezekiel 30. 3, verse 30, he says, As for you, son of man, now God's talking to Ezekiel the prophet, your people, of course that's interesting, that God doesn't say they're my people, he says your people, that's kind of like when your child disobeys, right, and it's, well, your, <laughs> your son, not mine, anyway, he says your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, I mean, it's, this might be people today talking about, well, we're going to go and hear the sermon, or we're going to go to this gospel meeting, they talk about you, and they sit before you. They come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people. Now he comes back, they, they look like my people. For today, they come and they sit in a pew on a Sunday morning. They look like Christians. And they hear what you say. We hear you. But they will not do it. Look at this. For with lustful talk in their mouths, they act. Their heart is set on their gain. And behold, verse 32, you are to them like one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. What a description of a sermon, right? For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. And when this comes, and come it will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. Do I ever do that? If you want the positive example, it's Numbers chapter 27, the last three verses. It's, it's when Moses is given an instruction from God, and he doesn't wait. It's immediate. God gives the instruction, and then right after God is done, Speaking to Moses, here's what I want you to do, Moses, with the priesthood. Guess what? He does it. Immediately. What if that was my hearing God? That I hear something from God, and, and, and as soon as possible, it might not be that I can always do it that moment, but as soon as possible, I begin... With the I intentionally begin to do it. And whether that's something like in Ezekiel's day where I've got some selfishness in my heart to work on, whether that's about how I treat other people, how do you hear from God? Are we more like the child that you say, take these toys from the living room, put them back in your room. And four or five minutes later, you look around and the toys aren't being put up. The toys are being played with in the living room again. We have One of the words we use in our house is piddle. You tell somebody to do something and then you find out they're piddling. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. You weren't supposed to say, say it that quite that strongly, Cody. Maybe we, give, maybe we give the kids a hard time. And we need to hold up that mirror. And how we respond when God says, do this. And we, can we, can we bring that again? And, and we as Christians piddle. Put it off. Or we just outright ignore. What God says. How do you hear? And then this last thought for you this morning. Our opportunity. What if we looked at this gospel meeting that's coming up as not something we have to maybe go to partly and all that, but what if we looked at it as an opportunity? And you know, I, I like alliteration. I try not to overdo it. But those just kind of work this, as I thought about the this meeting and, and times together like that. An opportunity for faith, to build our faith. 
We've got more opportunities than we normally do to hear from God. It's an opportunity for fellowship, to spend more time than we might normally with our brothers and sisters. We've got a potluck meal to enjoy together. Other opportunities, and see here I can plug feeding the guest preacher. Right? Opportunities to interact with members from area congregations that we might have as guests throughout the meeting. Opportunity to invite our friends, our families to come and be a part of this. Come. Enjoy the opportunity. What if we put that spin on it today? And yes, I included the food in there. It gets its own word. Right? We're about anything. We're about food. So come eat lunch with us Sunday and just come a couple hours early. All right? Will that work? There's that, that expression in John chapter 1. As those early disciples, they're not even disciples yet, but they will be. They're, they're first meeting Jesus. And they're so excited. And they use that expression, come and see. Now, sometimes as Christians, we get too much of that, and we need to do some go and tell, that sharing, that opportunity. But then there's a place to say, come and see. Come and see what this is about. Come and see what God has in His Word. Hearing from God. Because His Word is a powerful message. Powerful Word. If we'll only listen. That's why hearing matters. And as we look toward this week away event, it is our opportunity to share as brothers, as sisters in Jesus. Now Gary's going to lead us in a song. And we sing this song not because we have to sing an invitation song, but because it's an, it's an opportunity in its, of its own. If there's something that's not right, I need to make right. If I need prayers. Or if I simply need to be thinking about hearing from God as I listen and sing this song together. You need to become a Christian today. That's the opportunity for you. To turn. Make a life change. To be buried with Jesus. To have every sin washed away. To begin life anew. To live as a Christian. A Christian life. Let's stand and sing together.